In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tu, Iesus. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. So we'll hear today about our, our two saints for today, uh, Pope St. Pontian and St. Elizabeth of Hungary. Uh, so first, Pope uh, St. Pontian, or Pontianus, uh, was Pope from the year 230 to 235, and he was uh, the son of a, uh, a Roman, and he was a martyr under the Emperor Maximian. He was exiled to the Sardinian mines, and uh, where he died uh, after just, uh, I think, one month there, at very harsh circumstances. Uh, but he has the distinction of being the first Pope to resign. Uh, for upon his condemnation to the Sardinian mines, uh, he resigned the papacy in order to help effect a smooth transition. Now, this is due to the circumstance that at that time, uh, there was also this, the, um, I don't know, the dubious distinction uh, uh, claimed by Hippolytus of Rome of being the first anti-pope. So this is, there's a, a lot of history going on here, but uh, essentially this began with, um, there's Pope Zephyrinus about 20 years previous. And there was the, uh, the Donatist heresy, among others, and the question of the lapsi, what to do about those uh, Catholics who had apostatized from the faith uh, in the face of persecution. Well, St. Hippolytus of Rome thought that Pope Zephyrinus was lax. He was too easy on those returning to the faith, and he wasn't harsh enough on the Donatist heretics. And Hippolytus uh, believed and even campaigned that he should be the next pope. He had on his side uh, Tertullian as well as Origen, uh, two names which should stand out as not having ST dot in front of them. Uh, so, but rather than Hippolytus being elected pope, uh, Pope Cassian uh, I was, or sorry, uh, uh, Calixtus I was elected. And this was too much for Hippolytus, and so he had himself elected pope instead. And thus, thus began the first anti-pope. And Hippolytus would claim, make this claim through uh, the martyrdom of Pope Calixtus I, uh, followed by, um, I can't remember the next one, the next pope. Uh, but then he, uh, after that interim pope was uh, this one, Pope St. Poncianus. And they all continued that, uh, uh, we would say, the truth of the faith, readmitting even those who had denied Christ, even as St. Peter himself was. Uh, they readmitted them to the church after penance. And it wasn't as if these were easy penances, three Our Fathers and three Hail Marys, right? This was fast on bread and water for a year, right? Prostrate yourself before everybody who enters the church. So these are difficult penances. Uh, Hippolytus's position was that they were unable to be forgiven in this life and that their judgment could, uh, could not be known, but only reserved to God in the next. Too harsh, too rigorous, and so on. So uh, Hippolytus um, would actually, be interesting, be the one who would write the life of Pope St. Calixtus, uh, but he was exiled along with Pope St. Pontian, Pontianus. Uh, together, they both were condemned by Maximian and sent to the Sardinian mines, and it was there that Hippolytus was reconciled. And together, the both of them resigned their claims to the papacy, Pontianus, the actual claim, and Hippolytus realized the error of his ways, he was reconciled to the Pope, to the Church, and that's why he is called Saint, Saint Hippolytus of Rome. Uh, so Pontianus uh, and he both died in exile, and, uh, but the controversy was not yet over. Uh, uh, pope Anterus was elected, and he reigned for three months, and he also died, and there was still wrangling among the followers of uh, Pontian and Hippolytus. They couldn't agree who, who had been the correct Pope. Well, uh, we might be familiar with this story, is a man named uh, Fabian, who was a farmer, and he was uh, coming through Rome carrying his, um, uh, some legends have it, a cart of manure behind him. And the cardinals, uh, wrangling of who was going to be Pope, saw a dove land on his head through the window. And they said, obviously the Holy Ghost had chosen this man, and they elected a farmer to be Pope. And he was Pope for 15 years. And it was Pope uh, Fabian who brought back the bodies of Pontianus and uh, also Hippolytus and gave them a distinguished burial there in Rome, thus reconciling uh, both factions. Uh, so we see that um, 
uh, Pontianus, uh, again, the distinction, the, the first pope to resign, and in, in doing so, um, you know, perhaps it was his resignation first that softened the heart of Hippolytus, uh, who then also laid aside his claims and was able to be, to be reconciled. Uh, but again, just, just um, you know, one of the, the many examples of what the saints do uh, when they are inspired uh, by the heart of Christ. Or rather, I should say, when those people who are inspired by the heart of Christ do things, uh, it's what makes them saints, right? Because Christ is the source of all goodness. So our other saint for today, Saint Elizabeth of Hungary, uh, once more a person uh, with the heart of Christ. Now she was born much later, about a thousand years later, in the year 1207, and she was a daughter of Andrew II and Gertrude of, of Hungary. Um, and, and Gertrude's sister, her mother, uh, her sister was Saint Hedwig. So she's got, got kind of some, some saints in the family history. Well, Elizabeth of Hungary, when she was four years old, was betrothed to uh, what was called the Landgrave of Thuringia, the Prince of Thuringia, and that's like parts of Germany, Switzerland, um, Austria, like kind of all that area there was called Thuringia. And so she was betrothed to the prince of this um, uh, region, and so she was sent at four years old to go live in this palace, to be raised as, as a little girl. Uh, this probably ended up being to her benefit. Uh, for two years after she left, her mother was assassinated. Uh, this is due to the fact that although um, Elizabeth of Hungary's, uh, her, her aunt, St. Hedwig, was uh, very holy, her mother Gertrude was a little bit less than holy. Uh, she was involved in political wranglings. She got involved in um, some intrigues and so on. And so she was, she was assassinated because of her involvement, right? He who lives by, or she who lives by the sword will die by the sword. She who lives by intrigue will die by it. And so um, perhaps being absent from her mother was what gave Elizabeth of Hungary um, a better upbringing. She was raised uh, by pious and holy uh, persons there in the palace of the prince, the king of Thuringia. And she was married at 14 uh, to Ludwig, who was himself 21 years old. And it was a happy marriage for her, uh, very happy together. And he was very agreeable uh, to her pious practices. Uh, she would get up and do um, uh, long prayers at night. Uh, she was accustomed to fastings, to physical austerities. And he, he was very uh, amenable to this. He pretty much let her do uh, whatever she wanted in that regards, which, you know, some, some uh, and she was criticized by other members of the palace. They said she was uh, squandering resources, uh, you know, stealing the, the treasures uh, of, of the, um, the, the kingdom that belonged to the king and so on. Uh, but he defended her and he, he allowed her to follow those, those good and praiseworthy practices. Um, in fact, we have a, um, one of the miracles associated with St. Hedwig is she was bringing bread to the poor. And this, she, she loved to do this. She would, she would gather bread and, and, and food from the palace and take them out and give them to the poor persons uh, in, in the region. And one time she was, she was caught doing this by the king and some of his, um, his courtiers. And they demanded to see what she was carrying. They were accusing her of stealing the, um, uh, the riches of, of, the, of the castle. And so uh, she pulled aside the cloak in which she was carrying bread, uh, but they saw roses, red and white roses. And so this confirmed to the king that um, she was doing the right thing. Uh, but she went a little bit too far one day in his mind when she brought a leper uh, in and put them in their bed. And for the king, he heard this like, um, you know, I was okay with the bread, but this is a little bit too much. So he goes in and indignantly, he throws back the covers of the bed and there he sees uh, an image of Christ crucified, not a leper, but Christ himself. And so that was, that, that was enough for him. He didn't need any more signs from, from then on. He was completely, um, completely won over, right, by, uh, by his wife's uh, sanctity. Uh, she was helped um, undoubtedly by the, the arrival of uh, the Franciscans. This had been in the, in the year 1223, and she would have been married for two years and only 16 years old. And the Franciscans uh, showed up, which um, I think they had ju just been instituted, and she was very impressed by them and became a third order Franciscan herself. Um, uh, and that would, uh, you know, th th this, this showed her spirit of, because of course the Franciscans, they're, they're um, Charism is owning nothing, right? Giving everything away. And so this was something very agreeable uh, already to her. So she spends uh, the rest of her married life, um, which is only another four years, in doing good works for the poor. She built a hospital, uh, continued to give out uh, um, uh, provisions and, and things for the poor, for the orphans. 
Uh, but sadly, her husband died uh, in the year 1227. He was in Italy, and he was um, preparing to embark on, the, on one of the Crusades. And when she heard news of his death, uh, she said, He is dead. He is dead. To me, the whole world has died. Uh, so she very much loved him, and she was still only 20 years old. Uh, but her life uh, was not very good after this. In addition to her grief at her husband's death was now the fact that her, uh, the kingdom was now uh, turned over to her brother-in-law. And he was much, much less uh, inclined to her, to, um, much less agreeable to her pious practices. Uh, in fact, she was turned out of the castle by her brother-in-law uh, and her dowry was refused to her. So she had nothing. Uh, she had no money. She was turned out of the castle and her children even were, were taken from her. And so she was, um, she was penniless, living as a pauper. Uh, we have here the um, kind of the reverse story of Cinderella, who was uh, in rags and then became a princess, where here we have a princess, and after all of her good work, right after everything she had done for the poor, she herself was turned out and treated as a leper. Uh, but she bore it heroically. Uh, she would not, and uh, she would not remarry. Uh, she wanted to, she took a vow of celibacy, and persisted in that. I mean, she was 20 years old. She's still very young, very beautiful, uh, but she threatened to cut off her own nose if they forced her to marry, to make herself unwantable uh, by any man. Uh, she continued to practice very harsh austerities. Uh, she served the poor as much as she could, uh, but uh, perhaps not surprisingly, she died at the young age of 24 uh, from, from sickness, illness, and probably, you know, certain too from, from a, a grieving heart. Uh, well, not long after her death, uh, miracles began to occur at her grave, uh, so much so that um, not even four years after her death, uh, she was canonized uh, by the Holy Father. Uh, so what a life uh, of St. Uh, Elizabeth. Um, it kind of goes to show that we, you, know, you don't have to be in a convent. We don't have to live the life of a monk, a nun, or a priest uh, to have a religious and a holy life. Uh, all we have to have is the heart of Christ. And that's going to make whatever vocation we have uh, be holy, right? be, be uh, something, a, a life uh, worthy to be called uh, Christ-like. And so everyone can, can aspire to that. And that's what we, we can pray for too, right? Uh, if we have a religious vocation, uh, pray that others out in the world may see that, right? They don't, they don't have to. So many uh, um, um, uh, mothers, uh, fathers, men and women in the world, and they think, oh, if only I could be in, in the convent like those nuns or those monks, I could be holy too. Uh, let's pray for them, right? To, to, to have that realization, you, you don't have to have that, right? Uh, Elizabeth of Hungary, so many holy men and women uh, lived as kings and queens amid, amid the pomps uh, of the royal court, and, and they lived the life of Christ. If, if it's possible for them, it's possible for anyone. And so let's pray for that grace uh, for all those men and women living in the world. God bless you all in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.